a long time ago in the uh, in the year of 1979, a great year for the world. <laughs> I was not alive yet. <laughs> Neither was I. I was z- negative three. But in that negative time, four? there was a company named Avalon Hill. And this company put forth a game. A game called Dune. Based on the science fiction books by... Frank Herbert. Yes. Frank Herbert's Dune. The books that I tried to read once and did not like, but that was a long time ago. Book, you only tried to read the first one. I tried to read the first one in like middle school and I didn't like it. I don't remember anything of it. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I remember way back when we were, Scott and I were living up here before, you know, more people moved into the geek house's uh, sphere of influence. And we were so bored and crazy and just wanted to play games that we went to this local gaming club a lot. And as a result, we met two really cool people from a local college who, uh, like, they took us over, and they played board games with us. We played, uh, what did we play? We played Starfarers of Catan. Now, played- I like the mechanic of Starfarers and Catan with the question thing. Yeah, the problem is once you know the answers. Yeah, if anyone memorizes the answers, has an advantage. But yeah, I-, I think anyone who doesn't memorize the answers is stupid. Yep. And uh, we played other games with them, but uh, I remember one time we were at one of their apartments, and we're going to play a game. I think we're going to play that King Arthur game. And then suddenly, we start talking about this Dune game. And he brings it out and he shows it to us. And he's like, yeah, this game is super old and super out of print, but it's super awesome. And he explains it to us. And basically the way he explains us the game is he doesn't actually tell us how the game works. He just goes through the six different races that you're allowed to be. And he tells us what their superpowers are. Now, you know, you play a game like StarCraft. It's like the Zerg. They can make a lot of guys in Rush. Oh, man. The Protoss, they can make a few guys that are really powerful but expensive. You're like, oh man, right? Well, in Dune, do you want to go through the list right now? We can do it. We can give people the same experience that we got. I think we should because I I remember we were talking about asymmetric games that are good and how rare they are. And he was like, Dune is probably the best asymmetric game ever. What we mean by an asymmetric game, right, is a symmetric game is a game where every player is the same. In Monopoly, everyone gets the same. Everyone has the same starting money. Everyone starts in the same position. It's pretty much everyone is equal in the game. It's more like an asymmetric game would be like, say you play chess, but one side gets four knights and the other side gets four bishops. Yep. That not everyone is the same. You know, it'd be like uh, Starcraft, Protoss versus Zerg. You don't, you're not doing the exact same thing. Or like uh, Fortress America, where there's three players with one common goal and then one player who plays a completely different game. One player is America, and but that's more of a versus game, but it's still asymmetric. One person's America and plays by these rules. As opposed to a non-versus game. Yep. Such as? A co-op game like Arkham Horror. I think most games are versus games. I know. I'm just saying. Saying what? Okay. So the way he described this game is he basically just told us the powers of all the factions. So the Harkonnen, there's treasure cards. See, in this game, the the best thing about it is that you look at the board, it so epitomizes the world of Frank Herbert's Dune. Yeah, I don't really know anything about Frank Herbert's Dune, but I can tell from l- l- playing this game and looking at this game from what other people's reactions to this game that all the rules of this game mirror the world of Dune so flawlessly. Like, if you like Dune, this game is Dune in the same way that the Mario Super Show actually mirrors the Mario game. I mean, the first time we played it, uh, it, with a full group of people, the way the factions kind of ended up allied with each other was very much like what happens in the books. Yeah. But anyway, so the Harkonnen, they, oh yeah, I forgot what I was going to say here. I got to get back to that. If you look at the board, there's two piles of cards, Spice and Treachery. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. That's the whole game, Spice and Treachery. Yep. So the Harkonnen start with two Treachery cards instead of one. And every time they buy one, they get another one free. And they can hold twice as many in their hand as any other player. And there's traitors. You see, everyone has these, like, generals, these leaders, that whenever you're in a battle, you have to send one of them to lead the battle. And before you play the game, everyone shuffles up all their leaders. And everyone picks four and draws them. And you look at them. And you pick one of your enemy leaders and decide that they are in your pay. And any time you're in a battle involving them, you can if you wish, but you don't have to. Call out treachery and automatically win the battle and kill their other... All this business happens, and you win. And it's super fun and awesome. It's good. So, uh, the Harkonnen, they get, as traitors, every single person that they see in that stage of the game. So, everyone else has at most one traitor. The Harkonnen could have as many as four people under their pay. Everybody was gaga. So, think about that power, right? 
That's an insanely strong power. Almost cheating. You don't even know how the game works, but you can tell twice as many treachery cards as everyone else. Uh, being able to hold more of them and get free ones. Having four times as many traders in your pay as anyone else. That's ludicrous. And that is why this game is amazing. Is because everyone plays by has different powers that let them break the rules. And everyone's power is ludicrous. Every single player's power is ludicrous. So the guild, right? Now in this game, when you want to ship troops from your reserves onto the board, you have to pay to ship them there. And it costs more or less depending on where you ship them. You don't pay the bank. You don't pay some sort of abstract bullshit. Well, you do, usually. No, well, if you're shipping troops, you pay the guild. The guild is a player. So if Scott's the guild and I want to ship people onto the board, I pay Scott. Yep. Everyone pays Scott. Keep in mind that most players start with the mass majority of their people not on the board and they have to pay to ship them onto the board. And also when people die and go to the tanks, you have to buy them back and then you have to ship them back again. Oh yeah. The guild. Also. Think about how unfair that is. Also, they can take their turn at any point during the turn if they want. I thought that was an optional rule. It is, but most people play with all those rules. Okay. And if no one wins the game at the, after 15 turns, they win by default. Oh my god, think about how crazy that is. But the Harkonnen was equally crazy. So the Fremen, now this is with the optional rules, but everyone plays with those. In addition to their normal troops, three of their troops are elite. They move faster, they're not destroyed by other business on the board, and they're mostly immune to the storm, and they can predict where the storm's going. And Great. that sort of thing. Great. If no one's won at the end of the game and certain conditions, which are not that hard to make come to pass, come to pass, they just win. And if they don't win, then the guild wins. And they, like if the worm comes up, they can ride the worm somewhere and they don't have to pay to ship their guys onto the board. Uh, uh, so, the ultimate enemies of the guild. So the emperor has five of these elite units that he can deal with. And, you know, those treachery cards, you bid on them every round. And oftentimes you pay a lot for those treachery cards. You don't pay the bank, you pay the emperor. Oh, people are buying treachery cards all the time. Yeah, you pretty much have infinite money throughout the entire game if you're the emperor. Uh. So, the old ladies, the Bene Gesserit, they can, see, anytime two factions are on a space on the board, they have to fight to the death. The Bene Gesserit can, if they choose, coexist with other people's units and not cause a fight. Also, whenever they're fighting, they can tell you what card they want you or do not want you to play during the combat. You know what? You have to do what they say. Yeah, uh, you're fighting me right now? Yeah, don't use any weapons in this fight. No, seriously, you can't use any weapons because I said so because I'm an old lady. And if anyone ships anyone to the board, they get to take one unit and put it in the middle of the board for free every time. So, like, if, you know, it doesn't matter who ships. If, if I put five guys on the board, the old ladies put one guy in the middle. If Rim puts three guys on the board, the old ladies put one guy in the middle. And after all the factions are picked and before the game starts, the Bene Gesserit secretly determine one player and one turn. If that player or an alliance including that player wins on that turn, they don't win. The Bene Gesserit win instead. Uh, so if you, let's say the, the old ladies say they secretly, they write down Scott's going to win on turn three and Scott wins on turn three. Scott doesn't really win on turn three. The old ladies win on turn three. So a viable strategy for the old ladies is help someone else win on the turn that you predict. Yeah. There are a lot of fun ways to do that too. Now, how's the trades? They, uh, when, you know, when you bid on treachery cards, you don't get to see what they are. You bring you sure them up. It's not like a treatise. And then you bid on them. So, uh, they get to look at every card before it gets bid on. Uh, now, 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 there's another fun rule in this game that makes this power so much more interesting. You see, and this is what really sold me on the game. You know, most games like Shogun or Risk or whatever, you can make deals with people, but there's no kind of in-game mechanic for it. It's just, all right, I'll ally with you, but there's nothing to enforce it. You can just break them all the time, and the alliances really never play a big part in the game because you can't trust anyone. As Pete learned so famously the first two times we played Shogun. Yep. But, uh, there's other games like Settlers where you can trade very specific things in the game with a very specific set of rules. And it's very much like guided by the game. Mm -hmm. In Dune, you can trade without, as long as you do not violate the rules of the game and do not trade leaders or treachery cards or powers. Those are the only things you can't trade. You can make any deal you want with anyone. And the thing is, you can make deals secretly, but then they're not 
part of this rule. They're just part of a normal game. You can do it or not do it. No one has to follow through. If you decide to make a real deal, like say Scott and I agree. All like right, when Scott. you're bargaining, like when you're bargaining, like I can bargain with Rim off to the side quietly. I can just be like whisper, 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 right? And we could even make a deal quietly, but it's not bound by these rules. Right. So if we make a deal quietly, then I, if I break that deal, whatever, it doesn't matter. It was, we were just talking quietly. That doesn't mean anything. But if, we decide, all right, let's do this. We can come back out and say, all right, if Scott attacks Scott Johnson next round with 17 men, blah, and blah, and blah, and then we, and we ally, on, and we agree not to break our alliance up on the next Nexus, then I will give him 25 spice right now. Mm. Now I give him the 25 spice. It's not like there's a penalty if he doesn't follow through. He must. It's the rule. If you make a deal out in the open and you shake on it and it's, it's, a, it's a locked in deal, it is now the rules of the game. You must do it. You must. So with the house, I can see all the cards. I could say, sell people the privilege of knowing what the card is before the bidding. Or say, I'm fighting it real hard with the Harkonnen next to me. And uh, the Harkonnen just bought a bunch of cards. I could be like, I'll pay you five spice if you tell me and no one else what cards uh, he just got. Nah. Or anything like that. You can do all sorts of stuff. You also get to see ahead of time where the spice is going to be. Mm. Now think about that. Every faction in this game has a crazy fucking power. And if you look at any one, you think, well, they're going to win no matter what. But everyone, you say that about everyone. And I think that is what makes this game great. Yeah, it's like, hey, there are six races. Okay. Each one is different. Okay. This one can basically cheat. How do they lose? Well, that one can cheat too. In fact, they can all cheat just in a different way. And I think that's one of the things that makes this game really fun is, you know, whenever you play any sort of game, right? The game is all about restrictions. And if you learn anything from Counter-Strike, sometimes breaking the rules in a game can be fun. Because if you play a game and you have to obey all the rules and the rules are really you know, cons uh, constrictive and, and restrictive, and they don't let you do everything you want to do, then it can be unfun. And occasionally, you know, if someone gives you the ability to break those rules even once, it's like, yes, yes, I can break those rules, goddammit. Yes, I'm going to kick ass now. And everyone gets to kick ass in a different way all the time. So it's like, yes, I'm kicking ass. And everyone's kicking ass all the time. And everyone kicks each other's asses all the time. Now, the other thing I... uh didn't mention yet because I think I said something about oh well alliance this game handles alliances in perhaps the most awesome way any game ever has you see uh, whenever a worm comes up from the spice deck a nexus occurs and basically the game stops until all the alliances are settled and any number of players can form an alliance and you can only be in one alliance you don't have to be an alliance you can break them whatever you want but until the nexus ends everyone can form alliances as they please with whatever conditions they want yep and uh, if, now you see, to win the game, there are, what, five strongholds on Dune, on Arrakis. If any one player or any alliance of players has at least one token on three or more of these fortresses. At the end of a turn. At the end of any turn, the game is immediately over and they win. Yep. So let's say I have two fortresses and Scott has two fortresses and everyone else has bupkits. Maybe the Fremen have, like, one fortress. The worm shows up. The worm shows up. We just decide that we're going to win, and we do. So Scott and I say, all right, we ally. Great. If we still have at least three fortresses at the end of that turn, we win. Yep. Unless the old ladies predicted that one of us would win on that turn. Yes. Now, this rule, it, I mean, I wondered how it would work out, but the first time we played it with a full group of people, the worm came off, like, right away. And yep. I was the Harkonnen, so I had a fortress already, and I had a bunch of guys already on the board. And uh, I look around, look at Alex. It's like, all right, we both have a ton of money and a ton of guys and two fortresses between us. Want to just fucking win? And uh, we look around, and yeah, we allied, and then we won. And there's pretty much nothing anyone could have done about it. Nope. And the thing is, theoretically, you could make an alliance of five players and just fuck whoever was the sixth player and win. Yep. And that seems really out of the spirit of the game, but at the same time... I, don't I have no problem with it. I have no I... problem because I don't feel like that'll happen a lot. Because, think about this, this is, the game is much like, it, it seduces you, much like the power of Spice and why Dune was the way it was in the story. Alright, I could just be nice and share my victory with all of you, but what if I act like I'm going to be all nice, and then when the next Nexus comes up, before the game's over, 
I fuck everybody and win on my own. That's so much more awesome than sharing my victory with these posers. Or what if, uh, why should I ally with four of you when I can just ally with Scott? And then our victory is so much more meaningful. You suckers. <laughs> yeah. You want to basically, you know, if you are actually someone who cares about winning, which you should be if you're playing a game, otherwise you're playing it wrong, then you're gonna sort of naturally want to win with as few people as possible. Why would you, you know, I mean, you could technically always win. Like, Worm, everyone allies, game over. But that's lame. You want to do something awesome. And the, the motivation you have in playing the game is going to cause the game to always be awesome. And I remember when the first Nexus came up, it's like pretty much everyone formed these gigantic alliances right away. And then everyone kind of sat there for a minute. And then pretty much all the alliances collapsed as everyone started arguing and fighting. And for like 20 minutes, we argued about it. And it was great. Yep. People are like, well, I'll agree to do this, and I'll smash this, and da 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 And that, that alone made this game worth the price of purchase. That, that moment, when, when that first yeah. worm came up, was so great. I think this game is most similar to Diplomacy in that, you know, there's some rules of stuff that goes on in the board, and you sort of have to master and understand those things, or else you're going to be in a really weak position. But as soon as you master those things, right, and it's not too hard to master them, just play the game a few times, eventually, the game becomes... All the wheeling and dealing is the stuff that really matters, and all the other stuff is sort of a given, because it's unlike a lot of other games. Like, you play a game like, I don't know, Vinci, right? And who wins and who loses pretty much comes down to the final turn, you know? It's like, it's a close race, it's a close race, it's a close race, it's the final turn. Who got the most points in the final turn? It was Scott, yeah! In this game, there are five spaces on the board. You need three to win. A lot of people start with one already. Yeah, so... It's not too hard to get three. Pretty much every turn is like the last turn. Someone can win at any moment. So every turn, you play it like it's the last turn. And you're pretty much on the edge of your seat fighting for the game every single turn. And that is crazy awesome that, like, every single turn could be the last turn. Now, a guy whose name is uh, Gnarly Thotep... Uh-huh. With a you know, gnarly GN, uh, Adam Prince. Oh, okay. On Board Game Geek, posted a review that I think sums up everything I want to say about yeah, this Yeah, I game. know. I, I saw this review there when I was doing the pre-show research, like five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, and uh, um, this guy does a better- We've been talking for a half hour. It was more oh, than that. Well, his review is so much better than our review. I feel like our show is worthless in the, in the face of his review. Now, basically, I'm going to read the first few paragraphs of his review briefly, and I think- this will tell you more so than anything we have said, what makes Dune great. And if you ever played Diplomacy, you'll know this feeling. Because Dune, if nothing else, is the kind of game where if you're not close friends with someone, or you have trouble not taking things personally, you will lose friendships if you play this game. Much Maybe. like if you play Diplomacy. Maybe. <laughs> Alright, there are a few reviews out there. I'll skip that paragraph. Dune gives you, and the other players, the absolute, unrestricted, an utterly unbeatable chance to be a jerk. That's right. Dune allows you to be a huge jerk and all in the name of fun. And really, what's more fun than being a jerk? Nothing. Being a jerk to plenty of people at once? Jackpot. <laughs> this game, let me tell you, right away, like in the first game, I was like, I went over to Scott Johnson kind of on the slide. I'm like, all right, we're next to each other and we both have ornithopters. Let's just agree to ally and then win as soon as we can. And that didn't happen. I totally stabbed him in the back immediately. But at the same time, so many of the things I did in this game were such asshole moves. Like, all right, it doesn't really cost me much to send some guys over there to attack so-and-so. But you know what? I got spice to kill. I'm just going to ruin their chances of winning this round just because it doesn't cost me much. Yeah, I would basically, like, I, when I was the emperor, I didn't have, it's, it's hard for the emperor to actually fight because his guys all start off the board. So he takes him a while to get all his guys on the board. So just to, I would basically send guys out to their deaths in stupid battles they couldn't win just to make sure the game didn't end. And I would just basically suicide people. Oh, also the way combat works, I'll basically, I'm going to boil this down real simply. The, the mechanic you need to care about is that you both have a battle wheel with numbers from zero to 20 and you can only have 20 guys in the space. So that works out when you, you battle only have with someone, 20 guys. Yeah. So when you fight with someone, basically you play cards, whatever, behind your shield and a leader. But most importantly, you each dial a number from zero up to the number of guys you have there. So if I have 10 guys in the space fighting, 
I can put the wheel on any number from 0 to 10. Now, then you compare numbers, which is basically the number you dialed plus the battle value of your leader, plus any other effects, but there aren't many. Whoever has the highest number wins. Now, whoever, had, whoever lost, all their guys die, and they lose the space. But the person who wins loses, no matter what, a number of guys equal to what they dialed. So if I have 10 guys and I dial the number 5, if I win, I lose 5 guys. If I lose, I lose all 10 guys. So I can dial 10, which would give me a much better chance of winning because I have a, such a big number. But if I win, I lose all the guys, and it basically it's a kamikaze attack. It's so great. It's great. But, uh... Continue reading that review there. All right. Pros of the Dune game. Uh, allows you to act like a complete jerk for an entire session. All right. Con. Opponents tend to be jerks. <laughs> Pro. A flavorful, atmospheric game with enjoyable, tense gameplay. I think tense is right on. Con. May take a bit too long to play for some people. Doesn't take that long. It's actually it's surprisingly not long. Well, no. The first game we played didn't take long. The second game we played went on forever. Okay. Uh, pro, it's based on a well-loved book series. Con, extremely hard to locate and purchase without spending enough money to put someone's kid through a four-year college program. Yeah, this game was made in 1979. It is out of print. There's, you, there was a new copy on eBay. I bid 80 bucks on it. It went for 100 something. Eventually, there was a used copy on eBay, and with good timing, I was able to get it for $40, and it's luckily in almost perfect condition. So that was lucky, but this is a very hard game to get. We're yeah, and don't get me started on the expansions. You're not going to find those. No, but this game's almost impossible to buy. Isn't it great that we're reviewing it so glowingly, making you want to play a game that you can't get? Yeah, luckily, the rules are well known and on the internet, and uh, there's a con here. This is probably the most important con of the game. This may lead you to the urge to carve, lacquer, paint, acid, sketch, inscribe, program, virtually tattoo, or otherwise overdo your own personal copy of the game. A and lot of people out there have made their own copies of Dune. They get the rule book and they look at pictures on the internet and whatnot, and they, they make their own copy of the game because you can't buy a copy of the game. Now, luckily, there is a computer simulation version of this game that, from what I gather, is... All like 99% perfect. That's good. And, and it's uh, free. I, I'm going to link to it. I highly recommend you get some friends together. Don't play this over the internet with idiots. Get a bunch of computers, hot, however you need to do it, and play it with all of you in the same room. This game is so fun. It's if you are willing to deal with the fact that this game is incredibly hardcore. Yeah, it's, it's a super hardcore game. I mean, this is a nerd game from 1979, before there were internets, before there were really nerds and geeks. So this is when you had to program a computer with, like, basic, if that, right? So everything was hard for geeks back then. So this game is included in that. It is a hard game. It is not easy. But it is a good game. And it is awesome. And uh, if you're ever at a con, I think I want to run this game at a convention. Whoa. I think we should run it at Kineticon. Oh. Unless they say no, and I doubt they will, because Kineticon is like my favorite little con. We'll have to have people sign up for it, though. Oh, yes. We but, can't uh, let low-quality like walk-ins play the rare out-of-print game. Yeah, but I'm so about this game being run at cons by me. Mm, good call. All right. But anyway, seriously, if you, if you have money... Buy this game. You can get it on eBay for a hundred something dollars or less. Maybe you if, gotta you gotta try really hard. I got it for forty. So try it on the uh, with that program first to make sure you like it. Though I think you'll like it. Or just you know hang out with a bunch of friends for a weekend in college and make your own set. It's not that hard. Yeah, I mean it's it's a map which is a circle with some lines on it. It's a uh, you can even just print out a picture on the web. You need. 20, to 20 colored tokens of six colors. You can oh, buy those at the craft this store. This is my favorite one. Someone made like this wood lacquered one. It looks so hot. Is it? Yes. They won't sell it to you. Uh, we could make this. Yeah. By, by make it, I mean pay someone to make it. <laughs> uh, Actually, this is, we should do another show on this. because The only board game anyone should ever make for themselves is Crocodile. Uh, Tigers and Euphrates. Maybe. See, the thing is, looking at these pictures is inspiring me again. Because I've had this idea for a long time that I play board games a lot. Like, board games are a huge part of my life. And I feel like nothing would be... Like, you know, when you go to, like, a ping pong competition, right? Or a pool... Like, you go to a pool hall, and there's always that one guy who brings his own pool cue. 
or brings his own ping pong paddle. Go to the bowling alley, the guy with his own bowling ball, as opposed to you who rented an alley ball for a dollar. With your alley shoes. <laughs> alley shoes, alley ball. You gotta go play golf. He's got his own clubs. He didn't rent any. You He's know, got his own golf cart. Back when I was a kid, when I was actually his good, own at, golf good at mini golf, I would bring my own putter to the mini golf. Yeah. And uh, you know what? I'm not good at mini golf anymore because I don't play it that much. Granted. Who's the best at mini golf? Scott. Yeah, that's right. Though uh, I got to say, it's, it got kind of close at the last Wildwood. It did. It got real close. I like, know. I think I lost to somebody. You but did. You lost to me I and someone else. I win most of the time. He does. But and Scott, I never do poorly. Well, you, you didn't do poorly, but to, a couple of people did better than you last time. I yeah, by like a few strokes. But it, No, it came down. I remember because last time we played mini golf. Oh, we got to do show on mini golf. All right. I was down by a lot. Like the first, the first nine, I was sucking. I sixed out like three times. Uh-huh. But then in the second half, it was nothing but twos, and I caught up. Yeah. But uh, this game, we're not talking about mini golf. Even though Arrakis is kind of a sand trap. Uh. Sand trap for your soul. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had this idea that perhaps I should make my own set of gaming accoutrement. Well, I mean, RPG people already have this. They have their own dice. They have their own pencils and their own clipboards for their own character sheets. But I'm sheets. thinking, like, if I had a set of four tokens, like silver etched, like cheap silver, like sterling silver, with felt on the bottom, like, these are my leaders for T&E. And, like, I make stuff, for all the games that I care about a lot, I make stuff for those games, my own set. These are my pawns that I will use when I play chess. Yep, and for, like, every other game, just make a set of generic tokens and pawns and things that are all kind of themed to me. Yeah, these are my stones for when I play Go. And uh, I think, though, you know, because board games, it's sort of like unlike other games, you know, individual sports like, you know, golf or bowling, where each, you know, each person has their own individual equipment. A board game is sort of like the shared piece of equipment where everyone manipulates the same thing. So I think it's really much better to just make a custom set of the game. That's what most people do rather than have your own stuff. I mean, you put your fancy silver tokens on the plain T and E board, or do you just make a fancy T and E set with like, you know, the fancy board and the fancy pieces and the fancy to Yeah, but the thing is I always look forward because Scott and I, we play games at conventions a lot and we pretty much always win. Partly because we're obsessive about games and we play like played in T and E at a convention. I've played T and E so many times in my life that <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but imagine going to a gaming con. Like you're like, oh man, I'm gonna play Settlers of Catan. And then some dude sits down and pulls out his custom set of cities that are intricately carved silver cities with gemstones in them. And, he, <laughs> and he's like, all right, kid, let's play. You have your own cities for this game. Yeah. And your own dice. Yeah. And your own robber. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I roll seven, you'll be twice robbed. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing is you could make very generic pieces. And I think it'd be a cool thing, at least playing with friends. Yeah. You could make generic pieces that are applicable to many games. I mean. Like, ten colored tokens that are, you know, you could play with those in almost Plus, anything. the thing is, if, like, a bunch of us have a set like that, that's the kind of thing where, say, we're thinking about an idea for a board game or an expansion for a board game we own. We have all these pieces now that make it a lot easier to kind of visualize what we're thinking. Yeah, I think better, though, to do design board games, it's much better to just buy, like, m- chips and tokens and pawns in bulk than to try that. I am kind of thinking about making a custom T&E, because that is my favorite game ever. Yeah, we'd have to count the things, and it might be yeah. hard. Plus, the thing is, we could make one that's kind of customizable. We could. Like, make individual tiles to lay down. Geek-themed t and uh, No, I like the theme of t and That's what I like about it so much. It feels like playing this ancient, like, Mesopotamian I game. I know, I know, I know. It's so perfect. All right, we done? I think we're done. We're done. The Dune game is great. The spice must flow. And uh, there's, there are also nukes, so. Great. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. 
Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.